I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the December 2016 PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Amanda Silva, and I'm joined by my fellow PRS resident ambassadors, Sammy Sino and Raj Shah Martinez. This episode marks the final one in our role as PRS resident ambassadors, and we pass on the baton to next year's resident ambassadors starting in January, and I'm sure they'll do a great job. Today, we welcome our guest discussant, Dr. Rod Rorick, and we'll be discussing an article by Drs. Cohen, Pusick, and Matros out of Memorial Sloan Kettering entitled Health-Related Quality of Life Following Reconstruction for Common Head and Neck Surgical Defects. To date, there's a dearth of research on head and neck quality of life outcomes in the head and neck reconstruction, and prior studies tend to group and analyze incongruent anatomical defects together. So in this study, the authors sought to prospectively measure health-related quality of life in head and neck cancer patients undergoing surgery and reconstruction, and they specifically investigated the association with different anatomical regions. The study included patients with stage two or three disease who underwent resection and reconstruction, and patients completed the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, or the EORTC, Core Quality of Life Questionnaire 30, and the EORTC Head and Neck Cancer Module 35, preoperatively, and then at set time points, approximately three, six, and nine months postoperatively. The mean scores at different time points were compared with paired T-tests. And for analysis, the patients were categorized by anatomic location for their surgery, including partial glossectomy, mandibulectomy, oral lining, maxillectomy, total glossectomy, and laryngectomy. And for a little background briefly, the EROTC30 measures global and functional health-related quality of life in cancer patients overall, and the EROTC quality of life head and neck 35 adds consideration for specifics to head and neck cancer. So in this study, 75 patients were analyzed, and amongst the anatomical groups, there were no differences in the proportion of patients who had prior resection or post-op radiation therapy. However, there were some differences in the proportions who had underwent chemo and pre-op radiation, and this is shown in Table 4. Also of note, at two years, 53% of patients were no longer living. However, the authors do point out later in their discussion that this data may be skewed as they are a quaternary cancer referral hospital. Um, when you look through figures one through six, they do a great job of visually representing the data. Overall, physical role and social functioning scores at three months were significantly lower than preoperative values. And at 12 months post-op, none of the function or global quality of life scores differed from pre-op. However, five of the symptom scales did remain below baseline. And when they looked at the different anatomic locations, they saw that maxillectomy, partial glossectomy, and oral lining defects had better function and less symptoms than mandibulectomies, laryngectomies, and total glossectomies. And from 6 to 12 months post-op, partial glossectomies and oral lining defects had greater global quality of life than laryngectomies. So overall, based on their findings, the authors concluded that post-operative health-related quality of life is associated with anatomic location of the head and neck surgical reception. And additionally, surgery does negatively impact the health-related quality of life, especially in the immediate post-op period. And this should be especially be taken into account given some of the limited survivorship seen in these patients. You know, something I kept thinking while I was reading this paper was something that the authors then eventually addressed as a weakness in their discussion is that these measures were developed by something called the classic test theory, which means they can only be used for population-level research. And that's why they compared the mean scores for patients and they didn't look at individual changes. Then they talk about how the face cue was developed using this rash analysis method, which allows you to track an individual's health-related quality of life over time. And they're currently developing a face cue oncology to be able to look at this data in more detail at a patient level. So I thought that was something kind of interesting to look forward to, to this measure coming out and being able to apply that to head and neck reconstruction patients. But I'd be curious, you know, to leave the discussion out to everyone else now, see what you guys thought of the paper and anything that you would like to discuss. I really found this to be very breathtaking and heart-wrenching, to be honest with you, because not only was the mortality high, but we have to kind of stand back and say, are we really helping these folks? 
you know, is the cure worse than the disease? In the end, with especially significant cancer and head and neck cancer patients, it all comes down to quality of life. Is our quality of life in these patients helped by the types of surgery we're doing, especially in those patients with, you know, glossectomies, laryngectomies? I mean, you know, those are huge, huge types of uh, problems anyway. And, of course, compound that with their diminished survivability at three and five years. So I think this is one of the first studies that actually is really looks at those outcomes from a quality of life. And I think it's, a, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's pretty tough to face it. You know, these patients have a tough time, even after reconstruction with modern techniques. Also, this study highlights how important patient-reported outcome measures have been in plastic surgery. And I think it's really been revolutionary. And to see the work that Dr. Pusik's done and to see how I mean, these instruments, we used to ask surveys of patients that we would just make and send out and no one would check them. They wouldn't be vetted. All of these questions are rigorously scientifically tested. I'm sure when they implement a reconstructive base cue to these patients, this is really going to achieve one of the highest pinnacles you can achieve in medicine is that scientifically getting feedback from patients and then being able to take that back and not only learn from it as surgeons, but also present it accurately to patients that are about to undergo these major life-changing procedures. So I think this is maybe, as you had alluded, Amanda, maybe one of the first steps to outline what's going on and then also an opportunity to further work in this field by developing another instrument specifically tailored to these patients who are facing tough roads, obviously. The other thing I think it does, Amanda and Sammy, is I think that it truly, because these are now patient-based outcomes on quality of life, it really hits us in the face of saying that we may have a surgical success, but we may not always have a success that relates to quality of life for the patient. And I think this may really help us define in the future what is a great outcome. I mean, I applaud these authors from New York at Sloan Kettering. Now, granted, this is a very skewed type of population, and they mentioned that multiple times in the paper because, of course, they are at an advanced surgical institute that deals with these types of cancer patients. Yeah, it's just tough because I think this is a very nice starting point, but you, I feel like there's a lot of confounding in here. Like There's a lot of variation amongst all these different patients, and so that's what I think is so great about developing the face cue oncology is then we can look at studies tracking individuals and see because, you know, one a patient who has a requirement for a glossectomy may be very different from another patient who does and may have very different baseline quality of life. So I think it's a great starting point. Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything. And just to jump off something Dr. I think Warwick was saying, you know, I, I look at figure five and I think that, you know, because this is sort of the seemingly the take home point about which specific regions of tumor reconstruction that had changes. And, and I, I know there's stage two and three patients mostly. And I agree that mortality is still very surprisingly high. But one thing that to me is sort of a silver lining or maybe something that we can look at to positive light. If you look on that figure five chart, the nine month to one year post op, their scores did seemingly come up in their quality of life, at least for some of them. Obviously, that injectomy patients, I think, stayed flat and were consistently the lowest. But patients with oral lining or partial glossectomy, I think that highlights the fact that after ablative surgery and then with the reconstruction, the quality of life can either be the same or significantly better afterwards because now they're no longer bleeding, ulcerated tumors are gone, and the reconstructions can do well. I, I think the key that I took out from this paper in their discussion is it's really in the counting of patients to let them know ahead of time, hey, three months, you're not going to feel that great. In fact, you may feel significantly worse. But at six to nine months, that's when things really do start to turn the corner. And we see, we've see we seen people in other situations, similar to yours, et cetera, et cetera, who, who've gone better. And I think that hope for our patients, I think, is one of the things that's really highlighted here. You're know, getting this directly from the patients from these surveys. So I also commend the authors. I think this is tremendous work that, that's really critical for us all to know and be able to inform our patients. I agree, and I think that they need to know that certainly their NADAR, it seemed like the NADAR at most of these was at three months, at three to six months, and then you could see actually the changes in the patients with oral lining, those with partial glossectomies, even with total glossectomies, they actually improved over time. And I think that's the hope that you have to instill, even though the, the mandibulectomy, which surprised me a little bit, didn't do so well. But I think this is that type of 
expectations and realism that we just haven't seen before. All right. I think that brings us to our very final podcast for the year, guys. I want to wrap up by saying to Amanda, Sammy, and Raj, I think I mentioned this before. I, When you all came to me about this, I said, I just don't know how this would work. And it's been a spectacular success from all parameters. It's one of the most highly sought after things when people go online for the journal. So kudos to the three of you who are thinking about it and then for doing it and then following up and always doing so well. And I think it's been, you know, a true tribute to you all and to the future of plastic surgery is very bright with three wonderful plastic surgeons like you. I, as you know, we will miss you, but we're still going to continue to use and do more than that. And, and you'll see that as you uh, continue on the global open editorial board. So kudos and thanks so much to each of you for all of your hard work and focus on excellence. 